Hey again, YouTube. So I posted a picture of this monstrosity on social media, and uh, I got a lot more uh, interest and feedback than I thought I would. I just figured it'd be a interesting picture of a bunch of wires, but a lot of people were kind of interested in what exactly I did and why I did it. So um, I thought I'd, I'd zoom in real close by some stroke of luck. My webcam is happy with this, and uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd kind of do a little overview first maybe we'll poke around at it a little bit and then i'm going to do this mod on another board and try to do it better make it pretty and stable and whatever because this is this is a monstrosity so here's what we did right this right here this uh ls139 that's a multiplexer an address multiplexer and what it's responsible for in its stock state before i, I did terrible things to it is uh, the uh, chip selection for the SID and the VIC. And pin four here is what controls the VIC. Uh, address space D1000 through what, D3FF. And then this right here picks up at D400 to D7FF. The VIC and the SID don't need all that space. This was just a cheap cop out on Commodore's part you know, to save three cents and not put another LS-139 or a bigger multiplexer on the board. And I, I guess I get why they did it, but at any rate, you know, here we are 40 years later with all these new fangled add-ons and we need more address space to talk to all these things. So uh, what we've done here is take the two chip select lines for those two ranges of addresses, you know, D1000 and D400, and we send those into another LS139 over here, right? So the way these pins are set up, they're just, you know, one-to-one -one matched, you know, going right into this chip, right? So for uh, the, the 139, you can look up the sheet on it. Maybe we'll, we'll look at a diagram later. But it basically takes uh, an enable line and then two addresses into it and it can multiplex out four different signals, right? So that's, you know, basically how a multiplexer works. It's two in, four out. Think of it like a bank of four dip switches cascaded off a bank of two dip switches, right? It's just doing it really, really fast. So um, at any rate, we, we take the two uh, chip select lines that were going to the VIC and the SID, and I just bent the legs right out of the socket there. So they are no longer connected to the VIC and the SID. So we take them out of that socket. We hook it up to the enable line of the LS139, you know, the second LS139. And then these two pins, the gray and the purple, are going to address lines 8 and 9. Those address lines are also going to this first one. Um, but at any rate, I found places on the board. We'll talk about that later. Just... You know, for the sake of conversation now, this is addresses 8 and 9. So we have, you know, our two chip selects and 8 and 9, and those are the inputs here. And then what you get coming out is this yellow line is, you know, D1000, D000, and that's where the VIC lives. So this yellow line goes out to the chip select line for the VIC. So he keeps working as he always did, but he's not, you know, taking control of... Uh, D100, D200, and D300 anymore. That's what these pins are for. So if you have another I.O. device, um, input or output or both, whatever, you know, you can hook it up to the read-write line and use it for both. But uh, it's just like, uh, think of DE and DF on your cart slot, right? We just have more address space to hook things up to now. Um, on the other side here, this is D400, the first one, then you have D500, 600, and 700. So D700 I have going out to a modem, 5 and 600 aren't doing anything right now, and D400, this green line, is fed back to the uh, enable pin, or the, I should call it the, the proper name, the, the chip select, the CS line on the SID. So when that address gets called by a program, it goes ahead, fires up that chip, that chip reads what's on the data bus and does whatever he's going to do with it. So that's the brief overview of what this thing is. Um, we'll, uh, we'll dig a little deeper into, you know, where everything goes here, but I gotta, I gotta stop recording, readjust the camera, and then we can talk about the rest of the hookup. 
All right, talking a little bit more about how this thing is wired. Um, I found an old doc. I think it dates back to late 90s, early 2000s of somebody who was putting in a hard drive controller. And there was good information in the document, but uh, back then, I guess, people didn't care as much or this guy in particular just didn't care at all. But his recommendation was to break the chip select line to bend the pins on the SID and the VIC. And that is the last thing I want to do. And with this VIC, you can't anyway. Um, so at any rate, that's why I chose to, to bend the pins at the socket here instead of other places. And, you know, by doing that, then you got to figure out how to get the signal, the new chip selects that are coming from the new guy, right? You got to figure out how to get them back in. So I started tracing, uh, you know, looking at, at board layouts, you know, pictures online, and then just poking around with the meter. And I found this right here is a via that goes to pin 10 on the VIC, the chip select line. And then up, uh, where is he? Up here somewhere? Where'd he go? Yeah, I'm at a weird angle here, but let's see the green line goes here. Oh, here it is. It was right. I couldn't see it. It was green. It was camouflaged. But right next to the SID, there was another via for, uh, you know, the, the chip select line there. So I didn't have to screw with these sockets. I didn't have to bend any pins or anything. The only two pins you had to bend was on an LS139 that are cheap as chips, man. You get those things for pennies, I think. So at any rate, uh, the yellow line here, this is where we're injecting the chip select back into the VIC for D1000. And this is D400. So that's really about it for wiring. This mod, uh, I think, is really powerful in what it does, right? You know, it frees up a ton of address space on this thing. And it was very, very easy to do once I, you know, thought a little bit about, you know, what actually goes on inside of this chip. So speaking of that, we'll kick over and look at some diagrams. So what got me thinking about all this the other night, well, there was a lot of things running through my mind, but was... Uh, you know, finally, it was this little board I was looking at this. This is the D700 breakout board that uh, DeBone sells with the uh, the T-Bone modems over there, right? And you know, I, I thought, like, is D700 the only thing on that board? You know, what else has he got going on in there? So I went looking through it, and I, I think you can pull 500 out of it, too. I, I forgot what I wound up finding, but... Um, it, it didn't completely demux everything. It's capable of doing it because this is just a pair of 139s that goes in this board, but it, it's not wired as such because the board's so tiny, right? You know, he designed it just to do a D700 breakout. So I went through and I looked how he laid this out and I got to thinking, hey, what can I do to break out the rest of these addresses? You know, all, all the technology's there. It's just a matter of, of running some wires at this point. Um, and I don't want to butcher this board up too bad or anything because it, it's a nice little board, serves its purpose, it's pretty, and uh, I obviously don't do pretty. So um, I started digging around at schematics, and you know this is what U15 does today. Um, he is responsible for selecting the CIAs. Uh, IO1 and 2, the DE and DF ranges, and the VIC and the SID like we talked about. So we we basically, we're, we don't want to mess with any of this, right? You know, we want to keep the CIAs there, obviously. We want to keep the DE and DF lines as they are. But the VIC and the SID is just inhaling a bunch of address space it doesn't need. So this is where I started doing binary math and everything else, trying to figure out which address lines you need to pull in. And it didn't really dawn on me to just use the old chip select line. Uh, I was like reinventing the wheel, right? I was going to pull all the addresses out of the CPU and run them over and blah, blah, blah. And it was going to turn into this rat's nest of hell. So I finally just went on Google and typed in, uh, I think, uh, I typed in D700 something or other. And I came across uh, this GitHub project for CIA IDE. Somebody back, I don't know, 20 years ago put this thing together. And this was a way to put a third CIA in a machine and hook it up to an 8-bit IDE controller. 
So it's a big, long project. I obviously don't care about putting an IDE controller in the machine with all the storage options we have today, but this little nugget was in there. And I was like, oh yeah, dumbass, use the old chip select lines because that is going to select all that address space. Then you just have to demux it from there with eight and nine. Addresses eight and nine are already present at that chip. So this is way too easy to do, right? You know, the, the, the VI has got to be around there somewhere to, to tap into. And that's where the, uh, the, uh, what was it? The purple wire and, uh, Where'd it go? That one, yeah. So that's where our uh, the purple and gray wires came from. I started tracing around where are A8 and A9 on the board, and I was able to find uh, a via there and a via there. And I was like, all right, this is too easy now. I don't have to bring anything back to the processor. I can pull the stuff out of the board. It's already running around near these chips. This is going to be too damn easy. And that's when I broke out some breadboard and hacked together this gnarly looking pile of whatever. So um, all that to say, it's time to do it pretty. And this is not my pretty machine. This machine is just for, for screwing with. But um, So we got to figure out how are we going to do this pretty. So um, I think we'll do a quick little demo of of you know proving it actually works and after that we'll we'll start putting together a design to figure out how we're gonna do this nicely and neatly all right i think i got everything set up for a quick little test here so we will boot our happy little machine and i wrote these tiny little basic things that basically abuse address lines so here we'll find the one I wrote for 600. We're hooked up to the 600 pin over here with the scope. If we run that, there we go. You can ignore the little bump in there. It's because my ground cable is shot. So um, if it was grounded properly, it would look like a perfect little square. But at any rate, yeah, if we run this little program here, that line goes active. We stop the program, it stops. And that's all it is. I'm just poking the line on and off over and over and over again till death do it part. Um, if this were a stock C64, you would see, hang on, let's run the program again. So there it is, 600, right? You would see this on 400. And you're not 400 to just sitting high like you should so yeah that just goes to show you we are no longer monopolizing all those addresses with one little SID chip that needs a whopping 32 bytes of address space so take that Commodore I'm taking my addresses back all right so out with the newer in with the older here is a 250-425 board um, more or less the same thing is going to happen with it, except lines are going to be in different places, right? Because the SID's up here on this board, the VIC is rearranged, all that stuff. Um, so this board has a little bit of history. I picked it up, uh, I don't know, a couple, three months ago or whatever for cheap. The guy was advertising two of these boards for sale, and he sold them as working SIDs, comes with parts boards, and... When I got this thing, it didn't have a VIC. It may have had an 8701, but it was blown out. Um, and it had MOS logic. Ew, evil MOS logic. So uh, the 258 and the 257s I replaced. Um, you know, I, I try to boot the thing up. You know, I put a VIC in it and a PLA and whatever. And it didn't want to boot, so it had three MOS logic chips on there. Two of them were actually good, but um, I got rid of all the MOS logic. That stuff is terrible. So uh, at any rate, I tested this board a few months ago. I ran it for an hour or two. I did some minor mods to it, but it's more or less stock except for the, the PLA, couple socketed chips. Of course, not the one we need, so we're gonna have to socket him. And this is the one 
and just for grins, I did this little mod inside the can here. Hopefully that shows up all right. But uh, this is now composite video going out there. I jumped that inductor. I basically gave it the Adrian treatment, you know, like when he was modding uh, modulators a couple of years back. And I also put an audio jack in here because it, it had like a uh, tuning knobish kind of thing in there or something. I'm not real familiar with these PAL boards. I'm new to PAL land. But uh, at any rate, I put an audio jack in there so you can just have audio out, video out. That's a story for another day. That's quick and dirty mods. Um, I had to bust some stuff out of here so it, it doesn't do RF anymore. I mean, who cares? But anyway, so this is going to be our patient. So now we got to figure out how are we going to do this mod in a way that's not ugly and unstable and ready to short out and catch fire. All right, so it's late and my eyes are old, so I got myself a high-resolution picture of a similar board. Everybody knows the, uh, the Rob Taylor 60 clone boards, I'm sure, by now. These things are friggin' awesome. I built one. I love it. Anyway, um, it's going to be very similar to the 425 board. Um, you know, it has basically everything in the same place except the RAM, right? So, uh, pin 10 from the Vic right here. He is the guy that we need to uh, to toggle a chip select line from the D1000 address of the, the new multiplexer we're going to put in. So I did a little bit of poking and tracing, looking at my board and looking at these blown up pictures too. And so pin 10 comes out from here, goes up, hits this little transition point, that VA to get to the bottom of the board, and then it comes over and pops out, where was it? It was on this pin here. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Pops out on that pin right there. That, I think, is the closest I'm going to be able to get to this neck of the woods. Um, you know, thinking about it, though, it's got to get closer there. And I'm willing to bet this guy here is going to be our little guy. So we'll, uh, we'll have to tone out the board and make sure, but um, I can pull it from here, the chip select line, or I'm going to bet it's there. Um, the SID, I poked around there, and I found the closest V to him is going to be this guy here. If you trace this all around yeah actually you can see it right here on on the zoomed in picture right pin eight of the sid right one two three four five six seven eight goes over up in there so we're gonna have to run a jumper wire right there on the corner of the character on more or less but we're gonna have to jump from there down to the 139 neighborhood and like i said from there or there over to there and that's going to be where we'll get our chip select lines from uh, we will also have to figure out how we're going to get addresses eight and nine in there so i'm gonna to have to do a little more poking around at that but it's midnight i gotta to work tomorrow i got kids that gotta to go to school in the morning so i'm gonna bail out for now think about this overnight figure out exactly where we're going to pull our lines from and figure out how we're going to dress a chip in here somewhere nicely. Uh, I was thinking, I, you know, I'm going to perf board it again anyway, but maybe a piece of perf board stuck in here. Um, maybe I can do something creative and piggyback it on top of the 139. Because I was thinking about that too, right? You might be able to take pins four and five out of the chip that you're going to need, just bend them up through perf board and anchor them down that way and then you can just piggyback the 139 right on top of the other one it'll be a little pluggy kind of module with only a couple wires coming out of it so anyway that's it for now i'm going to sleep on this and we'll give it a go tomorrow see how we do all right it's the next day and i've been soldering so uh, all i did was pull the 139 chip u15 out of the board 
and I thought, hey, why am I going to chase these signals around, finding vias and running wires all over the board? The signals are right under the socket. So I just removed the two pins from uh, four and five. So yellow is our VIC chip select and green is our SID VIC select. And now we'll go about building a little module to plug on top of the original LS139 with a second one in it. And we ought to be able to keep things you know, fairly tidy. I want to keep the flying spaghetti monster out of this. I want to, I want to try to keep things as, as a uh, short a run as possible for all the wires and everything. That ought to just keep things a little more happy and stable and not looking so much like a train wreck. So, uh, on to the next, we'll start figuring out what this board is going to look like on here. So before I get too far ahead of myself and just try to start crazy gluing chips into this board somewhere, um, I thought it would be a good idea to break out all the lines we're going to need. So it's turning spaghetti-ish, which I didn't want, but these will be cut much shorter and I want to try to keep this thing as tidy as I can. But on the other one, I use those you know little DuPont headers and all that, and maybe there's good ones out there, but the ones I have are cheap. And I don't know that any of them are that great, especially when you use them as singles, right? You know, if you have like a, a block of four or eight of them or whatever, they bite on there pretty good. But when you just have like onesie twosie ones all over the place, they, they're they just not friggin' stable. So um, I'm going to solder this thing in there everywhere I can. So anyway, on to the, the different lines, right? So here on the board uh, was a vacant spot for hot and ground. It, they were beefy looking pads and traces going in there, so the, we'll be able to pull a fair amount of power out of this thing easily enough for a 139, and maybe later on if we want to add more stuff, we can come off this cap as well. But um, So I put a, a 0.22 microfarad in there. Probably could have done a 0.1, but I'm out of them, or I might have them up in the garage. I just didn't feel like looking for it, but a 0.22 is fine. Um, so that's, you know, this red and black are our power. Uh, the two address lines, 8 and 9, I was able to find here and here, uh, I'm sorry, here and here, the orange one. I forget which one is which. I'll tone them out before I go and hook them up, but that's addresses 8 and 9. Um, obviously, these are the two chip select lines. This red one, unfortunately, I ran out of different colored wire, but this red and the white one here, that's our, uh, the white is the VIC chip select on pin 4, and pin 5, the red one, is our SID VIC select. That's the old one, right? The one we used to use that was hogging up all, all the damn address space. So these will feed into our new chip. Uh, I think in the last little clip, we had the yellow and the green already in there. The green is the new SID select that's just for D400, and the yellow is just for uh, D1000. And... I think that's all the wire. So all this stuff is going to have to get hooked up to the new chip. Um, I have gotten this far. It's all I got so far. I put a socket on a board. I just folded over the connections on the bottom just so the thing will sit kind of flush. But uh, we got to do some soldering and stuff on here. We'll probably prep this next after I figure out exactly where this thing is going to lay and how I'm going to route the wires. So... I'm going to monkey around with a couple of different ideas here and see what the neatest way I can come up with is. Well, now this is the part that I hate. It's time to make, you know, the age-old design decisions of, you know, function over form and all that stuff, right? So, you know, this is itty-bitty little board that will house our chip, and you could stick it on top of a ROM, keep you know, open real estate here for something later. Could put it over the RAM somewhere. You could stick it right on top of the uh, the existing 139. Problem is, though, you, you wind up, you know, covering up important test points if you actually have to troubleshoot this thing or something or swap this chip out, right? Swapping this chip is going to be a pain in the ass as it is because you got to solder two wires to it. But... If there was another chip stuck on top of it, you can't even troubleshoot the thing. Um, could stick it on top of the PLA, maybe, or I, I don't know. But really, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, 
I'm more of an engineer than an aesthetics guy, right? So I'm thinking the chip needs to go which way? Chip needs to go this way because, you know, pin eights are ground and the right side of C200 is also a ground. So that'll be a tiny little wire there. You know, the hot wire needs to go to pin 16 up here. That'll be a tiny little wire there. You know, we can keep wires as short as possible, which I think is advantageous for a lot of reasons, you know, just signal integrity alone, but also not making a mess of things. Um, and then all these lines don't have to go very far either to get over to that chip. You can still get at every pin everywhere. Um, I almost like it on top of the, the character ROM, but, you know, if that ROM goes bad or something, you're going to be in a, a world of hurt having to deal with all this crap. So I think I'm just going to say there will be its home. We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do all the soldering we can first. I'll use some 3M tape, the really thick, good stuff. That's a great insulator and a, a great way to hold it down. We'll stick them right there. And then basically what I'm going to do is is bridge all the pins, right? You know, you see I got them bent over, so they're almost touching the pad next to it. And that kind of turns into a, a poor man's surface mount on this side. So I can, you know, do whatever pre-work I can to the socket. There's a couple of lines we've got to bridge. We'll get into that in a second. And then each wire I'll just tack right down to the corresponding pad next to it. And unfortunately, because there's not a lot of room there, I can't use the 90 degree pin headers. Um, so I'm going to use the vertical ones on there. And those will be our points later to hook up to the additional addresses we're gaining by doing all this. So, all right, let's, uh, let's get set up to prep a socket, I suppose. All right, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I could not solder this on camera. I don't have good angles of cameras and lighting and things. So anyway, here's our socket and it's really simple. It's just a socket and some pin headers, right? So the pin headers on this side are going to be D500, 600, and 700. Just above it is D400, and that's just going to be the wire going to the SID. Um, you notice they're offset because ground is on the bottom of this side. And then over here we have D100, 200, and 300 going down this side. So it's, it's really friggin' simple. Uh, if we flip them around on the back side, you see that? Yeah, we can see that. Uh, a couple of bodge wires back here. So this is what bridges addresses 8 and 9 across from pins 2 and 3 to pins 13 and 14. Uh, that way, we only have to have one wire coming in for each address line. We don't have to wire both sides of the gate, right? We'll just have this happy little bodgy on the bottom here. And then the uh, the pins are basically bent over and solder blobbed onto these pads. And this is where my fear comes from. And we'll see how well this method works or not. But when I go and stick this, this thing down to the board and tack all the wires onto the top side, what's gonna happen to these blobs here? You know, it's, it's not a good thing, so. Uh, these blobs might just fall apart, you know, and then we will no longer have a connection to the chip from the the outside pad. So I don't know what I'm going to do about that yet. I might, you know, if I was smart, I would have pre-wired the whole socket ahead of time before I put it in the board. So one thing we can do is go and pull all the wires off the board, pre-wire this thing, and then install it. Uh, we can hope and pray that it just works, and I'll just be very quick with the uh, with the heat when I'm tacking the wires down to it. Um, I could use resistor legs or something over here to build little bridges. I guess that's an option. You could put pin headers on the whole thing. Um, I don't want a bunch of pin headers sticking up if I don't have to, though. Maybe I'll take some pin headers and cut them down just so there's little stubs to solder onto. I don't quite know what I'm going to do about that yet. I might just tape it down and solder it and pray and hope for the best. And if that doesn't work, it's just a piece of tape wasted. We'll pull it back off the board and go for plan B. All right, we're going to wing it. We're, uh, we're throwing the Hail Mary. 
I'm just going to tape this thing down and hook up all the wires. I, I went and beefed up all the connections. I checked that I had continuity. I checked that there were no shorts. Everything is connected as it should be. We're just going to be real careful when we tack our wires down on top. You know, a little bit of heat, quick, quick. They're tiny, itty bitty little wires that are getting soldered on there, so I don't need a ton of heat transfer. So hopefully the blobs hold up. But uh, yeah, I don't feel like redoing all those connections on the board. So away we go. I'm going to go get the board. Uh, a little bit of 3M tape, and we'll get this thing moving. All right, here's the magic ingredient. I love this 3M tape. This is, like, the best stuff ever. It sticks to everything, but comes off easy enough if you really want it to. So, makes a great insulator. It's fairly thick. It's uh, just a wonderful thing. So, we're just going to plunk him down right there. Or a trusty razor knife not that much about that much and and this is a real pain with the camera in my way but uh there we go we will trim this up real nice and hopefully not trim my finger go instant daughter board just add tape all right here we go it's the final install hopefully and I say that now but uh so here's our little board with our 3m tape and we've got one little spot that's Seemingly a little higher than the rest, but nothing is poking all the way through. And it's not like we're putting a ton of pressure on this, so I'm I'm happy this will be insulated enough to not cause problems. And I'm thinking it just needs to go right in this little spot here. I, I don't want to obstruct other chips. You know, I went through this earlier, and I've been arguing with myself since then. But I just don't want to paint myself into a corner if. I have to troubleshoot something or have a ROM go bad or something like that. So we're going to go as close to the ROM as we can. There's still a little gap, but I want room in here to, to be able to solder. Might even pop him out while we're soldering if he gets in the way, but here we go. Now it's just a matter of hooking up all these lines. Um, I'll probably drop some kind of diagram to make this easier for somebody instead of having to play and pause and whatever. and. The camera's right where I need to like get in with a soldering iron, so I'm not going to do all this on camera, but um, everything's color-coded. I will do my best to document all this, and yeah, I will hook up some wires and see how we do. Alright, here we go. This is actually not nearly as terrible as I thought it was going to be. Left the wires a tiny bit long here and there, just in case you got to wiggle stuff around. But I think uh, all in all, it's definitely improvement over the first version on that other board. So all right, let's let's use a little beefy beefy and make sure all our solder joints are good. So we'll check the socket to the board first. Where is it? There he is. Alright, that's all good. Let's make sure nothing's shorted next to each other. We're good there. And then, let's see, 2 to... 13, 3 to 14. All right, we are good. So we'll go over this real quick. What's going where? We should probably check that everything's going where it's supposed to. I think it is, but uh, let's see. Green wire is our SID. So from green 
to pin eight on the SID. Is that? Am I on the right one? Yeah, green is supposed to be our SID select. So where is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Very good. And then orange is a dress line. You dress line next to it. Yep, eight and nine are hooked up. Yeah, so that's nine. And then this should be eight. Very good. All right, this is power. So let's just check on, oh, just any other LS chip. Oh wait, no, that's the wrong red one. I forgot there's two reds. This red is uh, going back to our chip, our original 139. Let's see if we can get inside that heat shrink. Now this, this one we can see all the way through though. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, this red is power. White line is pin 10 on the VIC which is off camera, but, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, no. White line comes from the LS139. Uh, that's the duplicate of the address line. The blue line is the other address duplicate, and then the yellow line is pin 10 on the VIC. And we are good. This thing's hooked up, man. I guess we should turn it on. All right, just for grins, let's turn this thing on with the new chip missing. Ain't gonna work. All right, black screen. Yeah, black screen. All right, kind of expected, just curious to see what it does. And now, oh, you know what? I just realized I never hooked up the ground. We need one more little wire there to ground. So uh, I'm gonna go find a little piece of black wire somewhere. All right, that's better. We have a ground hooked up. I think we're clear. Moment of truth. Hey, it boots. That's a beautiful thing. All right, I should probably get a keyboard my little SD drive, and we'll run some quick checks, make sure everything's working as it should be. And I thought, hell, while I'm at it, let's actually run diagnostics on this thing. And, uh, yeah, he passes. He lives. I think he's making more than the Turn that down. It's probably loud and obnoxious. Sorry about that. But, uh, yeah, we got a healthy one. All right, we will break out the scope, check our lines, and, and call this thing good. All right, I think we're all set up to do the last little bit of testing here. We will boot the machine. Our probe is hooked up to D500, you know, the first little breakout pin. D400 is the green line next to it that goes to the SID. So we load... Or this little basic programmy thing. If we run this, we should get some sound out of the SID and nothing on the scope. Yeah, it looks like the SID made sound. I'm looking at the little audio bars. All right, so if we load. There we go. We see it on the scope, and there's no sound coming out of the set. So, one works, they'll all work, but just to be 100% sure. Yeah, there's 600. I will move 
on down to 700. And honestly, if the Vic and the Sitter are working, we know the thing's working. But, you know, a little sanity check, I guess, every now and again ain't a bad thing. So, uh, yeah, I guess we can, uh, we can do the same thing with uh, D100. If we look at our handy-dandy cheat sheet, who's he, 53504? Yeah, we'll just cheat here, 53504. 3504. And really, you can poke any of the bits or any of the bytes in that 32 byte range. You know, it'll all work. So if we run that, the computer should not crash because the VIC's not there. And we should see it on this pin here. And we do. So, yeah, we're golden, baby. This thing works. Oh, I'm breaking the camera. And it's not terribly ugly. I've done much uglier than this and had it work well. So anyway, I think that's going to wrap it up. I won't belabor the point anymore. You see the mod works. Hopefully I've done a, a halfway decent job explaining how to do it. And if you got any questions, hit me up, man. I'm happy to help anybody, anytime, anywhere. And with that, I'll say see you later. Have fun. Go solder something. It's good for the soul.